Hello everybody and welcome to this special Explorer Live session. My name is Claire McNulty, I'm from the National Geographic Society and I have the unique good fortune to be working with our National Geographic Explorers right across Europe. I think some of you might be watching now so if you are, hiya, hope you're doing well. For, for those of you, for others of you who may not be aware that as well as the amazing media that National Geographic produces, we also support directly scientists, explorers, conservationists and storytellers, all of whom are working to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. We do this through the National Geographic Society which is a global non-profit organization. And ever since we were founded in 1888, we've given out more than 14,000 grants to people all over the world. When you get a grant from us, you become a National Geographic Explorer. And we've had explorers from many different countries and backgrounds working on a variety of projects, from uncovering ancient civilizations to protecting the future of endangered species. And speaking of endangered species, today is the beginning of Croctober, which is a special week of programmes on the National Geographic Wild Channel, which aims to give you an insight into behind the scenes of the lives of these incredible creatures. And so to celebrate this, we have brought along today our very own crocodilian expert, Phoebe Griffiths. Phoebe is a crocodilian conservationist and zoologist who's always loved the mysterious species that live in fresh waters. Most of all, the gharial, which is a strange looking croc species, which I have to admit I had never even heard of until I met Phoebe. So she grew up in Nepal and she was inspired by the Nepalese conservationists there who were working to protect the gharial and prevent its extinction. And so now she's joined the efforts to help the Gharial recover in and around the Chitwan National Park in southern Nepal. Phoebe's doing her PhD at the University of Oxford um, together with the Zoological Society of London. She's a member of the IUCN Crocodil Crocodilian Specialist Group. Uh, she's a research fellow of Himalayan nature and she's also, of course, a National Geographic Explorer. Phoebe's going to talk to us for about 15 minutes about her work and then there will be plenty of time afterwards for questions. So please do keep posting your questions and comments on the Facebook site. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So that's it for me. Just leave me to say over to you, Phoebe, to, Phoebe, to tell us all about the amazing Gariel. Awesome. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Claire. I'm really excited to be here today to tell you all about the gurriel, which as Claire said, is a very weird looking crocodilian. Um, in fact, here it is. And why I refer to them as wonder mums and super dads. So this is a gurriel in its natural habitat of a river. And as you can see, the gurriel has this really strange head with this long thin snout. But from the neck back, it looks like any other sort of croc. It's got this amazing streamlined body with this flattened, powerful tail for propelling it through the water, as well as its well-webbed hind feet for directing itself. And the reason the gurriel have this very strange shaped head is because they're super specialized for eating aquatic prey. In particular, they mostly eat fish and that thin snout means they can move their head really quickly through the water and they actually start catching fish at just a few weeks old. But it's not only fish they eat. They'll crunch on any other sort of aquatic creatures that fit in their mouths, including this adult male gurriel crunching on a soft shell turtle taken by gurriel expert Pankaj Kumar on the Chumbal River in India. Um, so they'll also eat amphibians and crustaceans, but because of this long, thin, quite easily damaged snout. They're not actually a threat to humans, which makes it quite a reassuring croc species for me to work on, even though they get really big. So male gurriel can actually get over six meters long. So you can see here this huge adult male and this white stick shows how big one meter is. And the little yellow stick shows how big he would have been when he hatched out of the egg. And in fact, Here's one of the little hatchling babies that he's looking after. And that shows you just how much growing a baby gurriel has to do when it's born. 
Now this lump on the end of the male snout is called a gara, and that's why they're called a gurial. So a gara is a Sanskrit derived word for a clay pot, and they're called gurial because it kind of looks like they've got one of these clay pots on their snout. Now, in fact, this is only found on adult males. So you can see here, this, this is a very young male and he's just starting to grow his gara. He's only just reached about four meters in size. And that gara will continue to grow throughout his life until it's a really huge lump. And for a long time, people weren't quite sure what this was all about. But PhD student Jai with the Gurriel Ecology Project has been researching Gurriel acoustic communication. And he's found that adult male Gurriel can make this really unusual noise called a pop. And they use this pop noise, which kind of sounds like a champagne bottle being uncorked to communicate with each other. Um, they use it for flirting with females during competition with other males and also for talking to their babies. And it seems that only males with a, gari, uh, with a gara can make this pop noise. So it must be something to do with um, their acoustic signaling. So Jai is continuing to work out how that works. Now you can see here how a gurriel looks quite different from a normal crocodile. So this picture from Nepal shows a gurriel next to a mugger crocodile, which is a crocodile that lives in the same rivers. And this just shows how different the gurriel's long, thin snout is from that short, broad snout of the crocodile. And the way that the reason they're quite different is because they're related, but they're not that similar. In fact, what it is, is they're both crocodilians. And within the crocodilians, there are three separate families. So one of those families is the Gavialidae. And there are two species in that family. The Indian gurriel that I've been talking about so far, and also a species you've also probably never heard of called the Thomas stoma, which is a really elusive gavialid that's found in Southeast Asia. Then the next family is the Crocodilidae. And that's what we think of as the true crocodiles. And the crocs exist all over the tropics in the Americas, Africa, Australasia, and Asia. And finally, there's the Alligatoridae, which is the alligators and caimans, and they're found in the Americas and also China. And they may all look quite similar to you, but to me, they look really different. Um, the gavialids at the bottom, they have these really long, thin snouts. And the crocodilids, they have this kind of cheeky smile and they've got these really sticking out teeth, particularly this protruding tooth on the uh, bottom snout here. Whereas the alligators have more of a friendly smile with their teeth slotted in. And what we can see here is a croc family tree. So this shows how uh, all the different croc uh, species are related. Um, and so the length of the different branches is the length of time since they uh, diverged in evolution. So the shorter the branches between two species, the more closely related they are. And here at the bottom, we can see the alligators and caimans, and they actually split from the other crocodilians about 18 million years ago. And here's a split about 40 million years ago, where the Gurriel and Thomistoma split from the other crocodiles. And there are lots of species of croc that are all closely related and just two species here of the Gavialids. So they're representing this whole branch on the tree of life. And that makes them evolutionarily distinct. In evolutionary terms, they are a really, really unique species. And that's why the Gurriel is an edge species. The edge program is a system for prioritizing species based on how evolutionarily distinct they are and also how globally endangered they are. So the IUCN Red List is an organization that scientifically determines how at risk of extinction species are. And the highest category of risk is a critically endangered species. So a critically endangered species could go extinct at any time and they require urgent conservation action. And that's the category that the gurriel falls in. And if we look back at the uh, family tree of all the different crocodilians and we color the branches for each species to show how endangered they are, we can see here the green species are not at risk right now. The gray species we haven't determined yet. The yellow species are vulnerable to extinction and the red ones are critically endangered. And we can see that the gurriel and the Thomas stoma here are both at risk of extinction. 
And if we were to lose them, not only would we lose these two fascinating species, we'd also lose that whole branch on the tree of life. So that's why they're an edge species. Now the gurriel are critically endangered because they only live in 6% of their former range. So historically, gurriel would have lived in the Indus in the west on the left-hand side of this picture, all the way through Northern India, Bangladesh, and possibly as far as Myanmar and all these rivers in the middle. However, they're now just in 14 widely spaced isolated localities. And in fact, in the red localities, they're not breeding there anymore. So they're at real risk of extinction. In the orange places, including this tiny population here, they are showing reproduction, but these are really, really small populations. And in fact, only the green on the map here, which is the National Chumbal Sanctuary in India, that's the only large self-sustaining population. So the gurriel really, really is at risk. Now, the reason they've declined is because they're very vulnerable to the building of dams and barrages on their rivers. These fragment the rivers they live in, they disrupt the hydrology, and they have knock-on impacts on both the gurriel and their prey. So although gurriel, after they were hunted previously, like many croc species, they have been well protected by the governments of India and Nepal where they're found, these dams and barrages remain in place, and this is really preventing recovery of, cro of these crocs. As well as this, they get accidentally caught in fishing nets as bycatch. So when these, these are called gill nets, and when they're set, they can sometimes entangle gurriel, which then drown. Or in fact, the gurriel can get the net entangled on their snout, and then over time they starve. And sometimes fishermen kill them or chop their snout off in an effort to remove them from nets they've accidentally got entangled in. Another big emerging threat is the mining of sand and gravel from riverbanks um, throughout their range in, for the construction industry. And this is a huge problem as it affects the whole river habitat. And in particular, it removes the soft sands that the gurriel need to nest in. So where I work on the gurriel is here in Nepal. After gurriel in Nepal declined in the 60s and 70s, the government established the Gurriel Conservation Breeding Center. In this center, eggs collected from the wild are reared up in captivity till the gurriel are big enough to be safe from predation, and then they're released back into the wild in the hope that they'll grow up to join the adult population. And th although this has prevented the gurriel going extinct in Nepal, and we've started to see a small increase in the population, the focus in Nepal has now shifted to protecting gurriel and the rivers they live in. But in order to do this, there were a lot of questions like, how much of the river needs to be protected in order to protect a single gurriel or a gurriel population? How often are gurriel breeding and so how quickly can we predict them to increase? Um, and also are gurriel moving outside of the protection of the national park and therefore putting themselves at risk? And so in order to answer these questions, we had to catch some gurriel. So this photo is of uh, some of my awesome team that I work with in Chitwan who are from the indigenous Bote and Maji fishing communities. And what you can see here in the middle of the photo is an adult gurriel we're trying to catch. So Aitaram here has set a long net all the way around this beach. And the idea is, as the gurriel comes off that, she goes straight into the uh, net and we can then remove her to put a tag on her. And if we don't catch her in that net, Sam and Kale here are both holding traditional throw nets that they'll throw over the top of her, and that's another way of catching her. However, this was a big adult female, and she'd lived that long by managing to avoid getting caught in fishing nets. So the second she saw the net set around the beach, she knew exactly what to do, went straight over the top of it, looked up, saw the guys with the fishing nets, and dove straight to the bottom where she knew she could avoid them. So we didn't manage to catch this female in this picture, but we luckily did catch 20 other gurriel. And so after we caught them, we put these uh, radio tracking devices on their tails and following attachment of the radios, we released the gurriel straight back into the river where we'd caught them. So the gurriel welfare was a big priority at all times. And then following release, we're spending two years following up on those gurriel positions. And to do that, we do manual tracking. Uh, so here's my awesome tracker, Prakash Basnet, who's actually been out tracking gurriel today. 
And what we do is we locate regularly where all the gurriel are in the river. And because of these tracking devices, we can identify individual gurriel, even when they're underwater. And this is helping us find out some really exciting information about the private lives of gurriel. Now, why did I refer to gurriel as wonder mums and super dads? Well, that's because they are totally awesome parents. So gurriel nest communally. All the females will lay their nests in one sandbank and they'll all hatch at about the same time, at which stage uh, we find that the dominant adults will help guard those babies. So in Nepal, that particularly is these wonder mums, these fantastic dominant females. So here you can see one adult female with some of her babies on her head, or they may be the babies of other females from the area. And what you can see here is this is a stork, which is looking to eat some of these baby gurriel on the riverbank and the adult female's not having any of it. She is gonna drive those predators off and keep her babies safe. What's also very cool is on the Chumbal River in India, they found that the males play a really important role in guarding the creches. So this super dad is looking after the babies of all the females that have laid in one particular area. And in fact, one male may look after over 2000 hatchlings. So that must be an incredibly exhausting job as a parent. Um, and in this photo, you can see just how many babies that is. And these huge sandbanks, which are what are needed for the gurriel to lay their eggs in. So these big white sandbanks are really fantastic nesting sites. Um, and here's Pankaj again, monitoring the gurriel in the Chumbal. However, we found in Nepal that the gurriel we were monitoring were a little bit more shy. So we were monitoring them using remote cameras and these allow us to monitor the gurriel 24 hours a day and find out exactly what they're doing. And we found it was definitely the females who are having the major role in looking after the babies in Nepal. So this female looked after the babies for many weeks. She had about 200 and she defended them against all sorts of predators. And it's just a flavor of how brave the mothers are defending their hatchlings. Here is a large tiger going up the nesting beach. And you can see the dominant female here is just following that tiger along. Her little tiny babies are all here in the water and she's just keeping an eye on it, just making sure what it's doing and that it's not going to be coming near. So they are absolutely fantastic parents. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to all my project partners without whom none of my research would be possible. And of course, to everyone who supported me, particularly big thank you today to the Gurriel Ecology Project for letting me use so many of their photos and talk about so much of their research. And finally, to my own host institutions. Um, I want to end on this photo. It's one of my favorites because it looks like I'm some sort of Gurriel whisperer who can creep up on a Gurriel and catch it on the beach. Uh, but in fact, I'm just, I just released it here. Uh, this is a Gurriel which had lost its snout and we'd accidentally entangled it. So we were just releasing it back into the river. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Phoebe. That was great. I love the idea that you can tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator by whether their smile is either cheeky or friendly. I'm not, I think I have to uh, rely on you for that one. I'm not sure I could be trusted with that. <laughs> and also, I just can't imagine looking after 2000 children. I've got two and that's plenty for me. So we have um, lots of questions which were submitted earlier through Instagram or Facebook. Um, so I'm going to start with a few that came in and we had quite a few people asking about your career, um, how you got there and any tips. So Moritz asked what you studied before this and then Kelly's wondering if you have any advice for someone who wants to follow the same career as you. Absolutely. So I studied biological sciences as an undergraduate degree. I then did a master's course in wild animal biology um, with the Zoological Society London and Royal Veterinary College. And then that was how I made the contacts that meant I then went on to study gurriel. Um, the really key thing, I guess, for me was I really wanted to work with crocs um, or work with animals. And so getting that experience working with animals was really important. So from quite a young age, I asked if I could help volunteer on a farm or at a zoo, um, or I know I had a lot of friends who volunteered at local animal shelters. Um, and that was a really helpful way of practicing working with animals and also knowing that that's what I really loved. Um, 
So that's from the sort of animal side. And then from the scientist side, it was really focusing on um, that sort of biology. Um, and in hindsight, we should have probably done a lot more statistics earlier because that would have been really helpful with this PhD. <laughs> That's funny. That's a common thing that people say is, you know, get your maths right, because it always helps. <laughs> so we've obviously also had lots of people wanting to do what you do, but then there are others who are more interested in the more dangerous side, shall we say. So on Instagram, Ghana asked if crocs are aggressive and Ali asked if you have ever been bitten by a croc. And I think I know the answer to that one. Yeah. So um, I'll start off with aggressive. It you should never ever approach a wild croc. While uh, crocodiles are all predators, um, and so they do pose a risk to humans, uh, especially the very large ones. And um, so, if you know that there are crocs in a river, it's always a wise decision to avoid that river. Working with gurriel is a little bit different. Gurriel never attack humans. Uh, there have been a few cases of people being bitten when a gurriel has sort of accidentally sought, thought maybe a fisherman's leg was a fish and then immediately let go. Um, I haven't quite been bitten, but when gurriel are defensive, instead of biting, they kind of swat sideways. And because they have those really sharp, jagged teeth sticking out, that can be quite a formidable defense strategy. And um, I don't know if you can see, but I uh, had some teeth to the neck when I, uh, it was my own fault, I mishandled a gurriel who wasn't very pleased about it. And so gave me a sort of swat to the neck to tell me to go away. Um, so gorilla aren't very aggressive, but they are defensive. And I have the, uh, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> well, I think you also showed that, um, you know, they're very protective as well. Right. And we had a couple of questions in the live Facebook about that. So John Paul was asking if the gorilla are only looking after their own hatchlings or others that are nearby. And I think you said they're also looking after others, right? They are indeed. They are looking after all of them. So um, in Nepal, we found that up to 20 females may nest in one area, but in India, that will be many, many more. And usually just a couple of dominant females will guard those babies and again, one dominant male. So you may end up with two or three adults and they will guard all the babies of all the females in that area. So maybe up to 2000 babies of which maybe only 40 are their own. Um, for the males, um, actually, as a um, Ravi is a PhD student and friend of mine who's currently researching the genetics. Um, so hopefully we will know a little bit more about how related the adult males are to these babies, which is a, quite an interesting question we haven't yet got the answer to. That is interesting, actually. And kind of linked to that. So Matt asks if that male involvement in the protection of the babies is unique to Gariel or if it's common in some of the other crocodilian species. Yeah, great question. So um, we're not entirely sure. So definitely all female crocodiles will show parental care or all female crocodilians show parental care. And uh, male parental care has been shown in some. Um, so muggers, for example, the other the sort of classic croc that live in the same rivers, they will definitely show parental care. Uh, but it's very hard to study in the wild because they're such elusive kind of cryptic animals. Um, so all females definitely do. We know gurriel males do because they're so much more obvious to see and definitely some other male crocs do. And perhaps as we're able to study them more using modern technologies, we might find that more males are involved perhaps than we thought. Great. And do you have, so Simon's asking if you've got any idea about the mortality rate of the babies. Do you know how many make it? Yeah, so it's a... Uh, Something we're trying to, to answer at the moment, I have a, a friend, Ranjana Butter, who's actually an EDGE fellow um, with the EDGE program I mentioned in my presentation, and she's trying to determine that in Nepal. Um, probably very high. So we found in the, in the crash stage when they're being guarded by the adult that most of them seem to be making it through their first month. But after that, the monsoon starts, the water levels rise, and the parents go off to eat fish. Um, and it's not unreasonable that maybe 90% of them are probably going to die in the next year or two after that. Um, so it's a pretty high mortality rate. So even though you see all these huge numbers of babies and you're like, yes, they're not going to go extinct anymore. By the end of the, uh, you know, 11 months later, most of them are sadly in the stomach of their predators. Oh, no. And uh, Raquel's actually asking, you know, which predators are they? You know, what eats them? 
Yeah, so uh, a lot of birds, so a lot of sort of wading birds like storks or herons or kites or other birds of prey, probably be eaten by big fish, uh, carnivorous turtles, um, mongoose, jackals, wild pigs, feral dogs, um, anything really. Apparently they're very delicious. Yeah, they sound really tasty, I guess. <laughs> um, so a couple of questions here. Lucy is asking, what made you choose the Gariel? And linked to that, Dave's asking, what made you decide to focus on this project? And how did you start? And in particular, how did you, you know, what role did the local population play in, in the work that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so um, I was very lucky to grow up in Nepal, um, actually in Kathmandu, so not down where the Gurriel are. But I used to go and visit and I heard this amazing story about how the Gurriel was going extinct and the efforts of Nepalese conservationists had pulled it back from the brink, uh, especially Dr. Tiataman Maske, who's a big hero of mine, um, who actually was the first person to do a PhD on Gurriel in Nepal and how they'd started this breeding program and rearing program and that had uh, saved the gurriel. So I'd always, I'd always known about this as a big success story. And um, then when I went back and I was doing my education in the UK, I um, was just super interested in fresh waters and would, would have loved to work with crocs. And then I heard that there was definitely a, a need and an interest in people doing research on Gurriel again in Nepal. And it was kind of the sort of the perfect coming together. I, I really wanted to work in crocs, but it was also really nice to kind of go home and to be able to contribute to conservation in Nepal, which had been such a big um, inspiration for me in going into conservation in the first place. And you work really closely with the local people there, I think, in the project, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I'm, I'm the only foreigner in the project. So um, uh, a large proportion of our team are made up of people from the indigenous communities of Chitwan, particularly from the Bote and Maji communities who uh, traditionally use the rivers. Um, so they know incredible amounts about where the gurriel are, where to find them, where to find the nests. So they've taught me so much. Um, and then also my trackers are also uh, local and so absolutely perfect um, for teaching me how to find the way around. I've taught them how to track the gurriel. Um, and so together we're hopefully finding out lots of useful conservation data. Yeah, it certainly looks like it. Um, we're gonna go back into the past now because a question from Michael on Instagram is what factors led to the crocodilians and the crocodiles surviving for so many millions of years? Very good question. So. Crocodiles of the prehistoric crocodiles were a much more diverse group than the crocs we have today. So there are hundreds of extinct species, ones that ran down their prey, which is slightly terrifying, some herbivorous ones, some incredibly huge ones, even bigger than the gurriel. Um, and so they sort of diversified. And so there have been for many millions of years, a lot of different type of these sort of crocodiliforms. Um, but then, kind of what we've just got today is the whittled down species that are this kind of perfect amphibious predator. So this is clearly the niche in which crocodiles kind of can't be outcompeted by any other group of animals um, because they are absolutely fantastically evolved to being these um, freshwater predators. Um, Great and so from the past to the future I mean you talked a lot about the the um, endangered species, but Abhishek on Instagram also asked, are crocodiles going to be extinct in the future? Yeah, so um, there's a real range in sort of extinction risk in crocs right now. So in the sort of 60s and 70s, crocs got really hammered um, um, by sort of illegal hunting or originally legal hunting for their skins. And the populations got really low and loads of species were at risk of extinction. But luckily, successful conservation has meant that there's very large populations today of species like the American alligator and saltwater crocodile that previously were endangered and now are not. Um, so for some species, we've got these really awesome conservation success stories, whereas for other species, in some cases, quite closely related species, um, they're really on the brink of extinction. And that's generally because they've lost their habitats. So the Chinese alligator, for example, is, I think, one of the most endangered crocs in the world. And that's because there's just no habitat really left for it in the wild. Um, and so the big threat today is habitat loss. And if these wetlands and rivers continue to be converted for human use, then we're gonna 
definitely see, sadly, the loss of some croc species. Yeah, yeah. A couple of um, quick fire questions now from Moshi, uh, again on Instagram, I think earlier. Can crocs see in the dark and how much sleep do they need? So yes, they can see in the dark, at least much better than humans. They have this reflective layer at the back of their eyes, which means that in, even in really low light levels, they can use um, the small amount of light there is to see. They also have a sixth sense that we don't have um, from something called the ISOs, which is a little sort of sensor on their skin. That means they can feel movement in the water. So they can still catch things in the water, even in total darkness. Um, I've forgotten the second question, sorry. How much sleep do they need? How much sleep do they need? Well, so it seems like crocs, they spend quite a lot of time not doing very much. Um, and they don't have, they don't do deep sleep like humans. They just spend quite a lot of the time on a kind of partial sleep. So they actually spend a lot more time than us asleep, but not with the kind of the full brain at once. So they're always on guard so they can wake up very quickly if there's a threat. Got you. Now we don't have much more time for live questions anymore, but just to say to those of you who've put questions in, uh, Phoebe's going to try and answer them afterwards. And I know someone was asking about um, how how they can follow your work, so we can put in all the links to that um, afterwards. But I wanted to just ask you, is there one kind of final thing you want to say about Gariel or Crocs that you'd like to share with everyone before we finish? Yeah, so um. Yeah, so I think Guri are absolutely fantastic. Um, they're just one of these most unique crocodiles and existing in the river and definitely worth finding out more about. And the, it's not just the gurriel that are really unique. Other croc species will have their other kind of special attributes. So one kind of cool fact to finish on would be that the Chinese alligators actually dig burrows. So they're a burrow digging croc. Um, so yeah, finding out more about crocs, you get all these kind of weird and wonderful facts. So I encourage you to, to, yeah, find out more about crocs. That's that's great. And I think if people do want to, they, they can watch a number of programmes on National Geographic World for, through Croctober, including one which I haven't seen yet, but sounds intriguing about the cave crocs of Gabon, which apparently hunt bats and have orange skin. So that's kind of super fascinating. But yeah, so please, everyone, you know, if you've got more questions for Phoebe, just put them in and we'll try to get to them. I'm sorry we haven't had time to get to everybody's questions. We had loads of questions pre-submitted because it's such a fascinating subject. Just leaves me to say a massive thank you to you, Phoebe, for joining us. That's been really interesting. And I hope to see everyone with another live Explorer session soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.